Shalom, shalom, Hevra. It's an honor and delight to be here with Dr. Daniel Boyarin, who is the Herman P. So and Sophia Taubman Professor of Talmudic Culture, Departments of Near Eastern Studies and Rhetoric at the University of California, Berkeley. He's currently the chair of the Rhetoric Department, and his research passions are the Talmud and all of its ramifications for Jewish and human life. I'm sure many of you have read Professor Boyarin's books and articles, so it's a delight to be here with you. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you. Um, I'm honored and delighted to be here as well. Thank you. Thank you. So to jump right into some of your current work, my understanding is you have a new book uh, you've been working on tentatively called something like, What is the Jews? A Manifesto. Uh, I wonder if you could explain a little bit about this title and, uh, and the ideas. Right. Of Thank you. Um, good question. Um, let, let me start with the, uh, with, the, with the first part of the title, which I'm going to have to fight with the publisher about because they, they don't like bad grammar in titles, even if it's um, intend, intended uh, to be provocative, but also it, in the, it really isn't such bad grammar. But let me explain. I'm, I am... Uh, I've been engaged for decades in what I think many of us, many of your listeners are engaged with in one way or another all our lives, which is trying to figure out what does it mean to be a Jew? And especially what does it mean to be a Jew right now in this place, in this historical, in this historical moment? As I imagine, most of the people uh, listening to this are aware, some will become aware right now. Um, I have been very uncomfortable with um, Zionism, and uh, I'm gonna nuance that in a minute, as, um, as a, um, a future for the Jews as a uh, as a model for Jewish existence as a as a uh, political and uh, social and cultural force for quite a while um, for for several decades, which seems or has seemed till now uh, to require that I give up on the idea of the Jews as a nation or national group. But since I don't like to make life easy for myself, I've been equally as unhappy with the idea of the Jews or Jewry as a religion, right? Um, and those have seemed to be the only two alternatives. Um, not, of course, uh, of course, not denying the profoundly religious implications and complications and content of of Jewishness. Uh, this uh, this. Yarmulke is practically uh, practically ingrown by now since it's been sitting on my head. I mean, not literally this one, but this one and its ancestors have been sitting on my head for um, over 50 years um, in public and in private. But uh, I, I don't think that uh, Jewry which is a, just a fancy or somewhat archaic word for what I mean when I say the Jews, is a religion. I think that Jewry is much, much more, not much more important, but much more than um, a religion or its religious aspects. Um, and when I published uh, recently um, my, my last book, in fact, 
which was um, a, um, an argument against the idea that there is something called Judaism that Jews have recognized as such forever, in part by showing that there were no Jewish words that mean Judaism until uh, sometime in the uh, late 18th century um, that the first word in any of our Jewish parlances that means Judaism was in German and that the word Yahadut in, in the sense of Judaism, it's an earlier word that means something else, but uh, in, in the sense of Judaism only comes in to regular Jewish parlance um, around the time of the Natsiv. And if we're talking about um, Orthodox discourse, it is really the Natsiv who, um, I won't say introduces the word, uh, uh, but who um, makes it widespread uh, uh, usage, right? Yiddishkeit is not uh, by any means an, an equivalent of Yahadut, because as we know, Yiddishkeit uh, refers to language, to customs, to, uh, to food ways, to folk ways, uh, to um, political structures, to lots of things that just don't fit into the Western category of uh, religion, which is in that sense a much more restricted uh, category. Um, it's only when we start speaking of the Jewish religion that we can say things like be a Jew at home and a, and a mensch in the streets. Um, so uh, that's, uh, you know, or I'm a German of the Jewish, oh, no, no, I don't even say Jewish, I'm a German of the mosaic persuasion um, so things so, like that yeah. if so if we can't simplify this enterprise to zionism or to judaism what are some of the implications of this argument either in right. terms of practical yeah. policy or in terms of uh, either intellectually or practically yeah uh, but for me intellectually is practically and practically is intellectually <laughs> you know i'm a litvak right <laughs> so that's uh, all, all four sides. <laughs> you know, when, when the great Shakespearean uh, scholar, uh, Stephen Greenblatt, who's a professor at Harvard, was introduced for the cover story about him for the New York Times Sunday Magazine, the first thing he said about himself was, I'm a Litvak on all four sides. So <laughs> it seems to have... Uh, cachet even among Shakespearean scholars. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it looks like I'm cooked. And in fact, when the, when the book um, denying uh, the Jews as a religion or Jewry as a religion came out, I started getting letters from, uh, from people, emails from friend and foe alike, have I become a Zionist, right? Because it seems that the only two alternatives are Jewry is a religion or Jewry is a nation. If I say that uh, Jewry is not a religion, then it seems that I'm left with uh, Jewry is a nation. And since the general understanding of the term nation nowadays is nation state, then um, uh, I seem to either to be on the horns of a dilemma. Nobody accused me of, of not caring or not having to be somewhere in the, in, you know, anybody who spends three minutes with me can, can tell that uh, um, uh, my, I'm, uh, profoundly uh, engaged with Yiddishkeit uh, almost at every minute of my uh, 
my existence. So, so I went back to the thinking cap, you know, the same thinking cap. And I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I thought for about two years. And I came up with an idea, which is not an entirely original idea. Uh, I'm not gonna say that I invented this. I, I don't wanna be arrogant at all in that way. Um, which is the idea of the non-sovereign nation. Or um, what my brother and I already several decades ago in an article that we wrote together called diaspora nationalism. Uh, and after, after an idea comes research. That's, that's what I do. I'm a professor, I do research. And um, I did a great deal of reading, of course, that's the kind of research I do. And came to the um, um, understanding that the word nation and the idea of nation, the concept of nation, has a long history um, that um, extends long before the idea of the nation state came into being. So that historically at least, it's perfectly coherent to think of a nation that is not the sovereign and sole governing collective of a given um, piece of territory. And, and I think that modern nationalism in the sense of the nation state um, is certainly doing a, a, a great deal of damage everywhere in the world. You know, um, just look at the Balkans uh, for one thing, and the, you know, especially the the resurgent Balkan nationalisms since the, the the fall of communism and the amounts of um, the amounts of killing uh, um, that are that are taking place in the name of nation states right this little piece of territory belongs to the serbs so everybody who is in the serb has to go somewhere else or otherwise be mistreated or even eliminated right this belongs to the albanians so all the serbs have to leave that area uh, the Moldovans, uh, Moldavians can't be, can't have Romanians, uh, but Romania can't have Moldavians. Uh, Greeks don't belong in Turkey and Turks don't belong in Greece, right? And this has, over the course of the 20th century and, and going now, been um, a source of um, tremendous amount of um, death and destruction. Um, directed against Jews also, right? Since Jews didn't quite seem to belong anywhere under the under nationalism, um, a lot of the uh, the terrible um, um, things that have happened to Jews in, in the twentieth uh, century, and I don't need you know the the events that shall not be named. Um, uh, have been in large part a um, a result of of that kind of nationalism. Now I know that uh, there are many folks whose reaction is, well, you know, you either do it or it gets done to you. Better that you do it than than that it gets done to you. Um, that is. Uh, certainly for me and I'm sure for many other um, people and particularly many other 
Jews in this context, uh, not a satisfactory answer. Okay. So, um, um, so I was pleased in my reading. You know, and I, I basically only discovered the 19th and 20th centuries um, in the last two or three years. You know, I've been I've been so busy uh, and so happy living in the the fourth and fifth centuries in Bavel um, and the uh, you know the the fourteenth century in Spain that uh, um, I didn't notice the nineteenth uh, uh, century much at all. Um, so so picking up on this, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. I don't want to interrupt you if you're mid thought. No, that's okay. Go. So picking up on this on this last point around um, relationships between nations, what can some rabbinic sources, or maybe even just one, tell us about how we how we collectively respond to these types of conflicts and and, and oppression that emerge from these national? Right. Well, look, I'm just going to give a quick answer now because because the the book is is more a manifesto than a uh, historical study, and in, in a sense, it's the it's it's going to be the least scholarly of any of, of, of any of my books, which means I hope that a lot of people will read it too. Um, but it, anybody who's really familiar with what we call classical rabbinic literature, um, and by this I mean especially the Bavli, but also a lot of Eretz Israel rabbinic literature, will we'll notice that uh, the rabbis were not great partisans of sovereignty, right? Stay away from government, right? Stay, stay away from rabbanut, which doesn't mean the rabbinical authorities, it means sovereignty. That's what it means there, right? Sneyat uh, rabbanut. It doesn't mean uh, hate the rabbanut or ashit, it means uh, hate the hate being in government, hate being in Srara. And the understanding that, that, that Jews could have the fullest kind of, uh, of, of, of national and religious life precisely when not governing um, it, it has very, very powerful, um, uh, very powerful, um, uh, roots in rabbinic literature, right? So that's uh, um, so uh, from that point of view, there's uh, you know, and and of course uh, people can cite other rabbinic texts that go in the other direction. And I'm not saying no. I'm not saying you know, uh, as we any of us who learn know that um, for almost any kind of ideology that you'll pull out of rabbinic literature, somebody can pull out a different ideology. So I'm not claiming that this is the definitive um, approach of the rabbis, but I, I think I could, could make a good a case for it being a, um, you know, um, a legitimate one. Um, okay, so uh, what, one last question for you, unless you want to ask, add anything else. Um, what what for you would you say is a, a most compelling Talmudic or rabbinic wisdom that persuades you most towards sort of a positive construct of what we are or what this enterprise is that we're engaged with? So if we're not a nationalism, if we're not a religion, right? What is sort of the vision or the construct that you think is most pervasive? Okay. So I I want to say we are a nationalism. Uh, we are a nation. Excuse me. Excuse right? me. Right, but. But we have to separate yes. two concepts of, of of the nation. Right, right. I, a one that is that that was um, extant primarily up to and well into the nineteenth century and still exists, which is of a nation being a group that has uh, passionately shared history, uh, language. Uh, canonized literature practices, whether they're called uh, "quote unquote" religious or or um, other practices, 
I don't actually make that distinction, but I'm saying, um, and uh, that what, what we need to find ways to let go of is the assumption that being a nation requires um, sovereignty over a, pe a piece of uh, territory. We have to learn to share territory, share sovereignty, uh, while um, uh, um, um, what, what everybody needs to do in order to be a Jew is not live in one place, but learn Dafyomi. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm exaggerating a bit in that direction, but uh, right. it, it's the sharing, it's the sharing of our cultural, our spiritual, our ethical, our historical, um, our jokes, our patterns of speech, uh, that uh, uh, and um, as I like to say in the last sentence of my book, will be, God willing, in Tirzu Enzo Agada. If we want it, we can make it happen. Well, indeed, indeed, this is quite the battle to put forth because there's no doubt, uh, I mean, maybe someone doubts it, that Zionism is the most pervasive form of Jewish identity today um, in the diaspora or in the land. And, um, this notion of sovereign nationalism as, as constitutive of what it means to be a Jew is, uh, is, is, uh, is something that should be contended with. So uh, thank you so much for this time and wishing you much that's luck on your continued work. Thank you, and you, you as well. Keep up the good work with Ori Litzedek.